I really love groups like this. I mean, I I say this a lot, but uh, there's nothing like an American inventor. We are people who can stare at a blank page and fill it, and very few cultures can. I travel all over the world. I'm sure a lot of you do, and people can make things better than we can make them. You know, production engineering and value engineering, all that kind of stuff. But nobody stares at a blank page and fills it better than Americans, as far as I'm concerned. Anyway, um, how did I get here tonight? I, I know Glenn for a long time. Where's Glenn? Oh, there's Glenn. <laughs> and he contacts me and he introduces me to Chris. And Chris says to me, listen, do you believe in the First Amendment? Thank you. I said, free speech? Of course. He goes, good, I want you to give one. <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I got here. Anyway, I want to start off by sharing a few numbers with you um, that have guided my career. I've been doing this around, this is my wife Cheryl, by the way. Hi, uh, Power behind the throne, the Eminence Greece. Um, and uh, she does all the numbers. But I have a few numbers I'd like to share. Uh, one is, I, I used to be in the feature film business. When I came out of college, I went to work for Paramount Pictures. I worked in Spain. I worked in Central America. And then I went to work for a guy named Joseph E. Levine. Anybody know that name? Remember mm -hmm. that? And Joe had just done The Graduate. And I was head of uh, kind of everything but the US and Canada for promotion, advertising, publicity, that kind of stuff. And one day he says to me, he says, you know, I'd like Sophia Loren's coming in. Huh? Sophia Loren's coming. I was like, how old was I? 21. One or two. 21 or two. She does the numbers. 21 or two. And says, would you go out to JFK and pick her up? We did a film called Sunflower. Does anybody remember it? In Italian, it's Ichi da Soli. It's a five handkerchief chick flick with Sophia Loren and Marcello Mastriani and Vittorio De Sica was in it. And um, he says, go out and pick her up at the airport. And I said, yeah. He says, take the stretch limo. He had this beautiful stretch limousine. I'd never been in one before. And, uh, and as I'm, I'm getting ready to go, he says to me, hey, do one thing. He says, I want photographers out there flashing. When she, in JFK in those days, they had something called the International Arrivals Building. All the flights came into the same building. So I, I would know where to put the photographers. And I said, but I've got the photographers lined up for Radio City Music Hall. The premieres tomorrow night, they'll be flashing like crazy. Why do we want them at the airport? And he says to me, well, he says, when she gets off the plane, she's a star. you got to have, he says, you don't need any film in the camera. <laughs> Just get people out there flashing cameras. I said, you can have the real guys at Radio City. I said, OK, I'll take care of it. So I took care of it. I get in the car. I shoot out the Van Wick. I get out to JFK. And <clears throat> Sophia gets off the plane. And she had uh, Ines Brucia and Luigi Zaccardi. I'll never forget their names. He was the financial guy. And she was like her assistant or something. She was lovely, you know, Ricardo, come stai, and you know, the kisses on the cheeks and everything else. Now we get in the car, and the, and the photographers are going crazy. You know, flash bulbs are going. And she has more baggage. Oh, he said that. I forgot part of the story. Levine said, also take a, a station wagon. And I said, but I got the limousine. He said, no, she's going to have so much baggage. You're going to need a station wagon plus the limo. And get a rack on top of it. Say, okay. <laughs> So now I'm out there, so she gets off. And there is a ton of baggage coming off. And the photographers are shooting like crazy. And now we're in we're on the Van Wick going back into the city. And I'm sitting in my first jump seat. And I'm facing her this way. And I said, i got to ask you a question. I'm young. I'm learning the business. I think, Why all the bags? You're coming for one night or two nights, whatever it was. And she goes, there's nothing in most of them. <laughs> I said, they're empty? She goes, yeah, they're empty. I said, well, why would you travel with empty bags? She goes, did you see all those photographers? <laughs> <laughs> well, they expect it. I'm a movie star. And I go, oh, OK. And then she said, this is where the numbers come in. She says, remember, it's 50% what you are and 50% what they think you are. <laughs> Critical. Always remember that. Perception is product. Perception is product. The next number is the 80-20 formula that I'm sure all of you know that basically 80% of the business is done by 20% of the companies. I think it's called Preto's uh, a rule. This is an Italian guy came up with it. And um, here's what it means in the toy business, but it's true of any business. If I, I'm going to spend my time trying to get a game published, I'm better off going with Hasbro or Mattel, where 
they're going to do 250,000 copies just to start. I'll make more money on a failure with a company like that than I will on a hit with the small guy who does 5,000 and puts his toe in the water. If I'm sure you, again, you've heard of the 80-20 rule. The other one is, um, I believe it's 90% marketing and 10% concept. A lot of ideas. I, I took, my, my patent search is a guy named George Harville at uh, Green Tree. Does anybody ever use George? He's fabulous. He's a great patent searcher. And I asked him the other day, I said, George, do some research for me. I'm giving a talk. How many of these, they're going to go over 10 million patents coming up. They'll be within, by the end of this year, they'll be over 10 million. And uh, I said, how many of them make money? How many of them are free? He said, probably about 97% never do anything. He, she sent me some article from Entrepreneur Magazine or something. So I think, again, it's the marketing. When, when I go into a toy company, if they have, God bless you, they have five or six ideas or three ideas, and they're all the same, you know, first among equals, they're all the same. I want to be, I want them to look at it and go, hey, go with Richard's product. Go with Richard if we if we're going to do it because we like working with him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's, that's an important thing. And lastly, the last number I have is this, 40. I'm sure a lot of you know the story I'm going to tell, but for those who don't, I keep a bottle, a can of WD-40 on my desk at my office, and uh, this is why. WD-40, WD stands for water displacement. It's a rust inhibitor. It's actually fish oil or something, but it was invented by a chap in uh, San Diego who had parts were rusting at Limburg Field, and he came up with this way of spraying this stuff on. But what does the 40 mean? It was the 40th attempt to get it right. Could have been WD-2, could have been WD-300, but it's WD-40. And I keep it on my desk to remind me all the time of persistence. Persistence is key. It gets it done. I always say never give up, never grow up in my business. But you can't give up. That's what it's all about. Okay. Now, you can't take yourself too seriously because you may need your invention to live, your idea to live, but trust me, the world probably doesn't need it. And these toy companies probably don't need to, to, to keep going. Mattel doesn't necessarily need what I'm coming up with. They want to see it. And by the way, the toy industry, how many of you guys invent toys and games? Any hands? It, it is a voracious appetite for innovation. You cannot imagine. Uh, they have departments that do nothing but work with outside inventors. You don't need agents. You don't need whatever. They go through products like, because most products fail. In fact, most products in the toy industry, even if they get taken by a toy company, may only last two to three years. Furby, which I'm happy to talk about later, tends to be the elephant in the room, but Furby um, was an anomaly. The stars lined up. It, you know, it went atomic. and it, have you seen the Furby organ? Have you guys seen it? Yeah. When you get out of here, if you want to see some, some crazy guy in England took 40 Furbies and turned them into an organ. And it was trending number six last night on YouTube. It's, it's worth taking a look at if you really want to see a creative guy. I mean, but uh, anyway, so don't take yourself too seriously and uh, keep your ego out of it. Ego is probably the biggest killer. Um, I find that... Uh, Anything I do, most things I do, rarely do it alone. Really, even, even I, I was working on a game today. I said to Cheryl, I was in trouble on something. I, I needed to get, I was boxed in, and I needed to jump to another level on gameplay. And I said, what would you do? And she says, I would do this. And I said, that's it. Do it. So there's always somebody else involved. So keep your ego under control. Um, I, you know, we are entrepreneurs. I like to work with companies that are, intra I call them intrapreneurs, the people inside the company, because they can contribute to your product greatly. Um, I had a game, our, our first game was called Advertising. I was reading the Washington Post one day on, on my couch, and I saw about the 100th anniversary of Procter & Gamble. And I said to Cheryl, I said, Cheryl, I said, the Golden Arches, 
The Golden Arches, what's that? He goes, McDonald's. I said, all the news is fit to print. At least it used to be. Uh, <laughs> New York Times. And on and on and on. All the Procter & Gamble, look my no cavities or whatever. And uh, this was kind of near the end of the trivial pursuit craze. You know, the trivia started. By the way, that's an interesting story. When Trivial Pursuit was shown to all the major game companies, there were three things, there were three reasons they didn't take Trivial Pursuit, which, by the way, made the inventors enough money. One guy has a private golf course. The guy made, they made tons of money. And here's why they didn't take it. Because one, they knew adults didn't play games. They were absolutely convinced. All the major game companies, they knew games are for kids. Two, um, Trivia is going to be in a book. Well, why would you play it in a game? I mean, there's trivia books have been around forever. And three, who's going to pay $25 for a game? Let me tell you, they were so wrong. It was finally done by a very small company and made a fortune. In the end, Hasbro had to buy it for like $70-something million dollars on top of all the royalties and everything else. But we were at the tail end of that, and our game was called Advertising. Now, when I went into the company, it was called Ad Infinitum. I was very clever with words. You know, I write books and stuff, so Ad Infinitum. I had a picture of Madison Avenue on the front of it. I took it to Parker Brothers, Milton Bradley. Everybody turned it down. Parker Brothers said, don't count your royalties yet. This is the cleverest thing I've seen until it got to their marketing department. And the head of marketing said, who cares about advertising? And I was crushed. And after about a year and a half of trying, you can't give up. After about a year and a half of trying, I found a small company in Chicago uh, called Catico Games, and I sent it out. I just normally don't do it. I just stuck it in a box and sent it. And I get this phone call, and this guy says to me, Richard Lee, I said, yeah, he says, it's Wayman Whitman. And I say, he says, ad infinitum. We love it. I go, what? He goes, we love your game. I, oh, well, that's terrific. He says, listen, he says, if you can get me 2,000 slogans. It, it had advertising, recall of advertising slogans and jingles and stuff. He said, if you can get me 2,000 between now and August, this is when they made things in the United States, by the way, we'll have them rolling off the presses in Michigan. They will print in place in Michigan by September. And we'll go to town. And I said, Wayman, this is terrific. I said, there's only one problem. The game's not ready yet for prime time. I have things to do. And he said, Look, he says, you've got a choice. He says, we can sell a million Fords, or you can wait for a Lincoln. And I said, I like Ford. <laughs> and, and we, frankly, we made over a million dollars with the game. It was like, the, again, the last in, a long, in, in this long train of, uh, of trivia games. But it was keeping with it. Oh, and Parker Brothers, by the way, which turned it down. I tried to turn it down. They came back to Catico and said, we'll give you a million dollars for the rights to the game. And Catico said, we're not going to give it up. And they said, OK, how about rights to Australia, New Zealand, and England? He goes, OK. So anyway, at one point, we had it all over, we had it all over the world. And it was our first, uh, it was our first game. And uh, it was a big success, but it was just sticking with it, believing in it, believing in yourself. Unless somebody shows me a fatal flaw in an idea of mine, or one of my associates that I work with, a fatal flaw, just keep going. Now, I'm not telling you to beat it to death, but there's no reason not to revisit it. Talking about revisiting, where's my bag? Okay. I'll show you something. For about 18 years, for about 18 years, I had a product in my attic that I wanted to do. What was that? My daughter is watching on uh, FaceTime, whatever it's called. So, FaceTime. FaceTime. So, uh, there she is. There's Betty. Betty invented a game called Here Comes the Bride at, um, six. at six years of age. And I actually got it placed. And they said to her, they, inter they interviewed her, they interviewed her, and they said, so Betty, what did it take to to get this game out? She goes, you need a dad to sell it. <laughs> but anyway, so I had this idea years ago for a cat paw, right? 
And this is the commercialized version. It sat for like 18 years in my attic, 15, 18 years, whatever. And one day I was cleaning things up, and I found it. And I said, I need something else. So I called one of my electronic guys. We all work as teams, as I told you. It's all a collaborative invention. And uh, I said, Bob, do me a favor. I'll cut you in. Pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Don't worry about giving away a piece of the action. 100% of nothing is nothing, so what's the difference? You just do more and more products. So I said, Bob, I'll cut you in, throw some electronics into this thing for me. And he did. Okay, so um, got on the David Letterman show, just sh sales shut up. We sold close to a million of them over the years, last three years. And uh, this will be raffled off for any cat lovers. And uh, then I write to the company. This is about three weeks ago. I said to the president of the company, I said, listen, I said, let's get back on the cat paw again. And he writes me back and he says, time for the cat paw to rest. <laughs> and I went, I never argue with my companies. I need them for the next one and the next one and the next one. It doesn't pay to, we did very well with this, you know, for what it is. It's an impulse novelty. And uh, so I just went away quietly. Then, about two weeks later, an email comes in, and it's from Michael, the president of the company, with wicked cool toys, and he says, cat has nine lives. <laughs> <laughs> so of course I want to read this. So here's what it is. They have, I don't know how many of these things left, and they're sending them off for closeout, but they got a new rep firm. And the rep firm's in all 50 states, and it's a big deal and everything else. And they say, listen, while you're repping our stuff, do me a favor. <coughs> Get, sell these off for us. And the guy writes back, and he says, where has this thing been hiding? He says, this is the greatest product you have. <laughs> now, he's being hyperbolic, but still, you know, he loves it. He says, we want this product, but we don't want it for children. You've already sold it to children. We want it for adults. We want it for crazy cat people. So, this is being reintroduced at Toy Fair next week. <laughs> so, when you talk about not giving up, there's a whole. I knew this market existed. I knew it existed, but it took somebody out there to it, like the guy that saw advertising and loved it. There's always somebody out there, I find, over time, that's going to love your concept. <coughs> but anyway, that's the, uh, that's the cat paw story. And so, we'll be back in business. Okay. I usually have a lecture. Where is he? Do you want to test this out? Some uh, people in the back here. Hello? hello? Oh, oh my God. I, I usually have a microphone. Okay. So um, let me see where I am here. Okay. So you have to sell yourself before you sell your product. If you don't sell yourself, getting through the door is critical, as you know. And um, if you, uh, let me tell you how I got through on my first toy, how I got through. I basically called up the office at 7 in the morning. Why 7 in the morning? Because in those days, well, they called them secretaries in those days. Today it's assistants or whatever it is. But in those days, secretaries got in at 8. But the boss, who was a hard driver, got in early. I knew they always got in early. And they always picked up their own phone because the secretaries weren't manning the phones in those days. So I called up and I hear, hello. And I said, yeah, listen, uh, my name is Richard Levy, and I've got an idea I'd like you to see. This was Milton Bradley Company. Got an idea I'd like you to see. Hey, who are you? I said, well, forget who I am. I said, here's what I'd like to do. At my own expense, I'd like to fly up. They're in Springfield, Massachusetts, East Longmeadow. I said, I'd like to fly up, show you a concept. Forget my name. doesn't matter. Just tell me what time to be there. I'm going to put the concept on the table, and if you like it, the only thing I'm asking is, is that you're able to make a deal on the spot. And maybe you'll send me home in a car or something to the airport, you'll be nice, and I'll tell you my name and whatever. And the guy says, how can I pass that up? <laughs> kind of crazy. So off I went, put it on the table. To make a long story short, they bought it literally on the spot. Now, let me tell you. That doesn't happen today. Today, have you guys presented to big companies, a lot of you? Any hands? Yeah? Well, today it's 
process first, <coughs> product second. I blame a lot of this on the lawyers, protecting the companies from themselves and everything else. Nobody can just make deals, whatever it is. But in those days, they gave me an advance check um, within a day or two with a letter. And the letter said, Richard will agree to sign a contract within 30 days. And I said, well, what if we don't sign a contract? He says, you will. He says, you'll sign one. Don't worry. He said, in fact, I'm going to give you the best contract we have. Did anybody hear of someone called Marvin Glass in the toy business? It was a huge, it was a huge product development house in Chicago. He says, I'll show you his contract. I'll redact, you know, certain terms, but I'll show it to you. I'm going to give you the best contract. And I said, great. I got to hear this part of the story. And I went down to K Street. And I got myself a big law firm. Remember them? Yes. Got a big law firm. You remember the bills? <laughs> got a big law firm. And I said, listen, I'm a first-time inventor, and I've got Milton Bradley, and they've sent me this contract, and they tell me it's perfect, but what do I know? So he says, uh, I said, can you represent me? Of course we can represent you. And this was a law firm on K Street with two floors. You went up, you know, through the staircase. And I go, I walk into this conference room. I don't know how many lawyers there were around the table, but I'm sure I was, I found out later I was paying them all. And they're sitting there. And I said, and the, man, and the man on the other end, by the way, no lawyers, he's sitting there by himself, of uh, executive vice president. And he says, uh, I said, he says, so Dick, he's going to be Dick. So Dick, where do you want to start? And I looked at my lawyers, and I went, well, here we go. And they looked at me. This big shot, making like five, six hundred dollars an hour. He looks at me, well, and I went, how about paragraph one? And the lawyer whispers in my ear, I can live with that. <laughs> so the bottom line is I wound up signing their contract because I believed him. I was right to believe him. You know, you want to deal with honest companies. Look, at the end of the day, business is about relationships. It's not about transactions. It's about relationships. And if you build the right relationship with a company, you, I, I had a product once with a company called Playthings, and it was selling like crazy, but we weren't making any money. And I get a call from the vice president, a new vice president came in, he's a friend of mine, and Lauren says, man, I, I gotta tell you how great this thing's doing. I said, yeah, but we're not making any money. He goes, well, how can you not be making any money? I said, oh, I see these numbers, but we're not making any money. He goes, what I'm about to tell you would probably never happen today. I challenge you to find anybody who would do this. He goes, well, let me look at your contract. So he looks at my contract and he says, my God, you're getting 2%. Why did you sign for 2%? I said, uh, I don't drink, by the way, so I have no idea why I didn't sign. Mean, I said, I must have been asleep. I have no idea. Because toy royalties are like 5%, 6%, so somewhere in there. I said, I don't know why. He goes, well, we'll fix this. And I said, you'll do what? You know, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to change the contract. We're going to put you where you should be, and I'll claw back as much of it as I can get for you. I can't get it all, but I can get a lot of it. I'm new on the job, and I'll tell them that's what I want to do. So relationships are critical. I can tell you time and time again about relationships. And um, what I mean by sell yourself, it doesn't matter whether you're a candlestick maker, a taxi cab driver, an engineer, it doesn't matter what the, you just have to know how to handle people. You just have to know how to handle people and treat them the way you would like to be treated and everything else. And they have to like you in the end, to invite you back <coughs> again and again. Because most of what these companies do doesn't work. If it was strictly money, every book Random House put out would be a bestseller, every movie that was put out by uh, Paramount would be a, you know, an Academy Award winner. But most things fail. Most things fail. So they've got to keep trying. So you want to be able to go back again and again and again, and not wear out your welcome. Um, I'm also blind, so I have to put it in here. Uh, teamwork. Teamwork is crit. As I said before, that uh, I always work with people. I love teamwork. Both long before they called them teams. That's kind of the last decade or so, I guess, maybe longer. I'm getting older, but uh, everything's a team now. But it is a team. And um, you want to work hand in hand with these companies. And you want to say please and thank you. And you want to, uh, it's just, 
do, do, a lot of these places are just big monoliths. Remember, these people have jobs, they've got to pay for, you know, they've got cars in the garage, they've got mortgages on their homes and everything else. You just got to treat them in a way that they're going to open the door for you and help you. And they, and they will. They'll help you make things happen. They'll tell you how to make your product better. In the case of advertising, uh, I get a phone call from the guy who said to me, uh, I don't know about ad infinitum. Clever, but I don't know. I said, well, what do you want to call it? He says, oh, we're going to call it advertising. I said, advertising? God, I don't know that I like that. But okay, I mean, you're paying the bills. He says, and then we're going to do something else different. I said, what's that? He says, well, I like the artwork on your package. You did a fine job, but we're not going to have any artwork on the package. I said, you're going to do a package with no artwork. Said, yeah, we're going to be the first game because they want to stand out of the clutter. It was actually brilliant. I didn't understand it at the time. I was so new to the business. But basically, you can look it up online, advertising. They uh, just took the name advertising and put it across a red field. That's all it was with a little tagline on it. And it was absolutely brilliant. It just, But that wouldn't have happened. The name advertising wouldn't have happened. None of the would have happened if the company wasn't contributing. So you want to welcome these companies in. And you don't want to be crazy about it. The other thing is when you deal with companies, you want to deal with the best companies, the blue chip companies. You know, uh, there's two kinds of amateur inventors, the paranoid and the more paranoid, <laughs> right? They're afraid to even show their lawyers sometimes what they're working on. So you want to work with companies where you don't have to be afraid, like companies like a Hasbro. I mean, they're not out. I know we've all heard the story of the, the Sears wrench and there are anomalies like that, but generally speaking, these big companies that want to work with outside inventors um, are very upstanding, and they'll do everything to help you bring your product along. In fact, if you want an agent and you're in the toy business, you need an agent, you call Hasbro Mattel and you say, hey, what agents do you like to work with? And they'll give you a name. They'll say, here, work with Schnackenbacher. He's great. He gets in here. So they're very, very cooperative. What they really want is the product because the toy industry is the fashion industry and you can't get caught with your trends down. They know it. they got to be on top of it. Um, the other thing is there's always, I was talking to Arthur who, who runs the, um, the American History Spark Lab and the, uh, the Innovation and Invention Center. Have you all been down there? Everybody went down there. It's really fabulous. We, we had a tour of it the other day. Um, and uh, I said, you know, Arthur, I, we were talking about Edison. And I said, well, what about Tesla? Of course, everybody says Tesla was the guy behind Edison or whatever. And, you know, there's always multiple. I said, Arthur, there are always multiple people in every project. Multiple inventors, multiple people contributing. I don't care who, you, you ever look at, a, look at a crawl at the end of a television show or look at a uh, Spielberg movie, any of these feature films, and look at the credit crawl at the end. It's not just Steven Spielberg or George Lucas or whomever. It's a whole lot of people become involved. And you've got to realize that from the beginning. You've got to open your arms to that. You've got to be willing to do that. Because if you're not, if you close it out, you're, um, you're asking for trouble. It's, you, you just, and they, by the way, I don't care how great your idea is. If they don't like working with you, they won't. A lot of these more sophisticated companies simply put you on a, as they say in Washington, PNG, persona non grata, and that's it, because they don't need headaches. They got enough problems. By the way, the other thing in the toy industry about products, they'll run three products at the same time, because one may drop out, two may drop out. So don't crack the champagne until you get your first royalty check. Just because you sold a licensed a product to a toy company doesn't mean it's going to get to Toy Fair. And if it gets to Toy Fair, it doesn't mean it's going to make it to the retail shelf. And if it makes it to the retail shelf, it doesn't mean it's going to go off the retail shelf. So, but um, that's a very important thing to realize. Um, let me see. Yeah. Honesty. You've got to flaunt honesty. Never lie to a company. Never lie to a partner. Never lie to anybody. And if there's a flaw in your product, like somebody goes, great, this is the greatest thing in the world, I love it. And then you should say, if there is a problem, say, by the way, 
couple issues I want to tell you about. <coughs> because if they find them on their own, which they're likely to do, everything has a flaw. Nothing is perfect. Uh, even products that get to market aren't perfect. I can tell you what's wrong with anything of mine that's ever gone to the market. I'm not going to tell you, but, but I could tell you. Um, so you want to flaunt honesty with these people. And then, you know, we have, a, we have a saying in the toy business, and it goes to a lot of industries, if you can't fix it, feature it. Right? I remember with Furby in the beginning, my God, it makes so much noise. What's going to happen when the media puts a microphone up to it? All they're going to hear is... <laughs> So we're thinking about blimps, you know, blimping it, making, reducing the sound through different kinds of cushions and this and that and everything else. Then we said, wait a minute. Why well, just tell them that's what a Furby does? Huh? I said, yeah, we'll, we'll feature it. Feature the noise. And anyway, noise was never a problem. But if you can't fix it, feature it. Make a big deal about it. Um, okay. Teamwork I talked to you about. Honesty I talked to you about. You miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Keep trying. Throw it out there. Don't let it. It's not doing any good sitting in your closet. And you may. And by the way, if you don't know what you're doing, team up with someone. I talked to you about teamwork. If you can't get through a certain door, team up. Again, don't be afraid of giving a piece of the action away. Just team up with the right person and let them. Hey, if you're more technically oriented than marketing oriented, I'm more on the marketing side. Although I can. I've learned over the years how to put things together, but you got to team up with someone, and that, then you'll sleep at night. Um, don't be motivated by the money. It's a cliche, but you'll come up shortchanged. Uh, I've never thought about money in any of these products. I, they just do what they do, and I see. Look, if any, as I told you before, if these companies knew how to make did, how to make money, then everything they touched would work. Every television show, you know, they wouldn't be canceled, they would, whatever it is. So you got to keep trying. And you got to do things differently. You've heard if, if it's not broken, don't fix it. Right? You've all heard that? My, I like to say if it's not broken, break it. And if a company says to me, like let's say for example, I talk to you about uh, featuring something. Company says, well, that's impossible to do. How are we going to do that? That's too hard. I said, listen, once we solve it, think about how tough it's going to be for your competitors. See? Whether there's a patent or not, we figure it out, they'll never be able to get it. And they go, okay. And then you keep trying. And just like the Steve Jobs with the, remember when he went over to the uh, Corning glass? Remember on the, on the iPhone? There was a glass that he wanted. He said Corning could make it. The president of Corning said to Jobs, no, no, Corning can't make it. It's called Gorilla Glass. It's on the front of an iPhone. It says, no, we can't do it. He goes, you can do it. I'm telling you, we can't bring your technical people in. Let my technical people work with your technical people. And Corning did it. They did it. So it's often, it's, there's, there's no, look, we put people on the moon for goodness sakes. So just about anything is possible. At least you got to think that way. Um, I told you about relationships. Oh, learn to take rejection. Rejection to me is nothing more than a rehearsal before the big event. That's all it is. Uh, no means not now. That's all it means. Unless somebody shows me a fatal flaw, I just keep going. It's as simple as that. You know, I used to be a wrestler, believe it or not. And uh, I had a, um, a coach who was an, actually a, a bronze medal winner in, in Greco-Roman. And he was teaching us about setting goals. And Does anybody here break boards or bricks or anything? God, this crowd, of course, there's somebody that does. I kind of expected it. Anyway, the whole idea is, is looking at an invisible point, an imaginary point under the brick, under the board. Am I right? Yep. Yeah. So if you thought about the brick and you thought about the board, if you thought about the resistance, if you thought about the difficulties, you'd break your hand. So I like to focus on something beyond the success. Whatever it is that I focus on, I never focus on let the problem be an impediment to me. I just go through it the way somebody's hand would break lumber. Um, okay. Lastly, because I want to get I want to get a lot of questions for you guys. I know I always get a lot of questions, Pinka. Um, 
Lastly, you really have to believe in yourself. You really have to believe in yourself. And uh, not just your product, but deeply in yourself, that you're right, that you know, and, you know, and then, as I say, never give up, never grow up. So what I'd like to do is, because I could go all over the place here. If somebody had a question about Chinese patents, I have a very interesting angle on that. But anybody that wants to ask me questions, then I can keep the talk going. So who's got questions? Yes. Let's start with the Chinese patents. Oh, the Chinese patents. So, okay. So here's what I do on Chinese patents. If someone's going to knock you off, where are they going to knock? Oh, well, let's first talk about global patents. You've heard these stories that they say, I can't afford to buy patents all over the world. I can't get one in Italy, France, wherever it is, everywhere in the world. But you've got to think, where, where are these companies that knock you off, potentially knock you off? Where are they going to uh, make their products? They'll make them in China. Right? So Chinese, I typically get a Chinese patent, the PRC, and a Hong Kong patent. They're not expensive. And, I'll te and they do work. They do work. Well, when the political atmosphere is right, they work. Let me tell you a Furby story. So Bill Clinton is president. And this is no reflection on President Clinton or politics or anything else, but it's just an interesting dynamic. One of our warships sends a, um, a cruise missile into the Chinese embassy in Belgrade. You remember that? All of a sudden, the Chinese weren't enforcing the Furby patents. They were shutting down knockoffs right and left. The missile hit the embassy. The lawyers went back and said, hey, this guy over here, he's uh, knocking off for, what? I'm sorry, what? It took a while for our relationship to stabilize with China for them to start enforcing it again. But typically, the Chinese will enforce their patents. And they're not expensive. And I never think about any place in the world other than the United States. And then within a certain amount of time, I have lawyers that do this, but with a certain amount of time. And I, by the way, I never do my Chinese patents through a US attorney. Because all they do is step on the fee call the same people I'm calling overseas. And by the way, I never do my patent searches through an attorney. And they'll say to me, and I've got great attorneys, but they'll say to me, why aren't you doing it through me? I can give you an opinion. I said, John, let me tell you something. I said, you, I'm gonna go to George, and you're gonna go to George. And George is gonna charge me $400, and you're gonna charge me $1,000, or $1,200, whatever that fee is, I haven't paid it so long, because you're gonna write a letter. And you're going to tell me in the letter something I can tell just looking at it. Can I do my product? Can I do my product? Am I going to infringe? Am I not going to infringe? I've been doing this long enough. I can figure it out. And now, if I want to figure out a way around the patent, I can come back and hire you and say, okay, let's analyze this thing. But I don't have to waste money on a lawyer. I hope there are no lawyers and they're running patent attorneys. I, I don't have to waste money on a patent attorney. You're a patent attorney? Oh, there is one? See, you're going to disagree with me, but I've been doing it for 40 years. Um, anyway, I go right to my patent searcher. I indemnify the lawyer from any damages that if the patent search is wrong, and I've never had a problem in, I don't know, 60, 70, 80, pro who knows how many products. I've never had a problem with it. But, uh, and as far as the Chinese go, the overseas, if anybody wants names, I'm happy to share them, but I have great firms in... Uh, in Hong Kong and another one up in Shenzhen, and they do it, and they alert me whenever the, uh, the renewal fees come along. I'll get a note from China saying, Richard, you owe us so much, and, and I pay it, and everything is cool. Okay, so that's the, uh, you know, any other questions? Yes, sir. No, go ahead. Oh, the, I, I really love how you look at inventing as just an aspect of life, part of your life. I was wondering, I, I think it was all really great advice, I was just wondering, when you are living life as an inventor, do you actually look at the market as your inspiration for your next invention? It's a great question, a great question. Yes, I do. Remember, I'm marketing oriented. So I look at things, for example, there was a, a movement going um, years ago, 1998 or so, and I saw this book, Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus, and this guy, John Gray. 
And I said, ooh, this could be a hot game. So I called Harper Collins and I said, can you put me in touch with Dr. Gray? And they said, well, yeah, and what do you want? And I said, well, I'm a game inventor and I think men are from Mars and women are from Venus would make a great game because I'm reading, he just had like seven pages in Time Magazine, Barbara Walters had just done a two hour TV special on this guy. And I also know that uh, women, women typically buy the games and they can't get guys to play. They're jumping around, whatever they're doing. So something like this, a woman can say, hey, this is my game, we're gonna play this game. Whatever, I had this whole thing in my mind. So I get his phone number and it, they say, uh, call him at two o'clock on this, whatever the day was, he's out in California. So I call, him, hello, and I said, John Gray here. And I said, hi, this is Richard Levy, I'm a game inventor, um, I'd love to do a game, blah, blah, blah. And it, no offense, my counselor, he says to me, it all sounds interesting, he says, but I gotta talk to my lawyer. And I go, okay, so I'll call you back. I said, fine, I got off the phone, I looked at my wife and I said, the deal is done. It'll never happen. He'll talk to his lawyer and it'll just never happen. Just, there's just no way. So the phone rings about an hour later. It's John. And he says, look, my lawyer's in Europe. I can't find him. I said, John, let me just say this. Timing is everything. The time is now, and I, that's my quote, the time is now and I'm the guy. I said, I want you to, I'm gonna give you the names of the presidents of Mattel, of Hasbro, and several other companies. I want you to call up, and I want you to ask about me, and then call me back. And I, he said, what kind of a deal would we do? And I told him what the deal would be, and he goes, okay. He goes, let's do it. And I said, well, what about your lawyer? He goes, forget him. <laughs> you sound honest, I like to sign, I don't have to call anybody. Let's do it. I'm gonna tell you something. We went on to sell oh, a million and a half copies of the game. We got a seven figure advance on the game and everything else. And John said, well, what about between you and me? What kind of a deal are we gonna make? I mean, we knew the deal, but what about the paperwork? And I said, well, here's the story, John. We can spend a lot of time and money having lawyers go at it between us, just checking every phrase and checking every this and that and everything else. Or we can go in together, because the enemy is the toy company. Not the enemy, they're not the enemy, but they're, you know, that's the opposition, if you will, in negotiating. I said, and since I can't do anything without you, we'll put in the contract that you have approval over everything. I'm, I can only make money if you approve this, and, and then we've agreed to what the percentages should be. He goes, okay, let's do it. We never wasted time, we never wasted expense. We went right to Mattel, we made a deal, and the thing soared, absolutely soared. It was a huge, did anybody remember the game? Do you remember the game, Men of Mars? Yeah, it was, it was really a big product for Mattel at the time. Um, I, I took it to Milton Bradley as well. I went there first, because they're, they're really my buddies. And uh, they didn't get it. They just didn't get it. Um, anyway, so, and then they came to me afterwards and they said, well, why didn't you give this to us? And I said, check the paper trail. So what do you mean? I said, just go in the files and the files will tell you how many times I tried to convince you guys to do the game, but you wouldn't do it. But see, I was able to, in fact, I called the vice president at the Marriott of Providence, Rhode Island, woke him up to tell him about the idea because I have a relationship. It's about the relationships. See, okay, I go on, and yes. Thank you for that question, young man. Yes. I'm trying to learn from your experience. We have provisional patent, non-provisional. Would you go to a licensing agency with just a provisional or you will also find I, I do provisionals all the time because, you know, I never know if it's going to work. If Look, if no company, I don't manufacture anything myself. If I did stuff myself, I'd probably want to go to patents and everything. But to me, it's about getting a provisional and then going to places I'm comfortable with. And then if, if a company licenses something for me, typically they want to take over the patents themselves. They have their own patent council and everything. 
they put the patents in our name, but I let them prosecute the patents. What do I care? They're better than I am anyway. And they're paying the legal bills and everything else. And then I just let the provisional go away. Or if I haven't licensed it, I reapply for the provision. You know, I mean, it goes away, and as long as somebody else doesn't come in, I can get it again. Yeah, but you know. um, when the company filed for the non provisional, yeah. is the inventor's name is you only, or you and the company both? No, the company has never been on mine at all. They assign it, we assign it to them. There is the assignee, you know, they're assigned to whomever it is, but they never. Now, I've seen cases where contributions were made by engineers at a company and they want to put the engineer's name. Well, they put the engineer's name on it. What do I and Look, let me tell you something. As long as the royalties are coming to me, okay. I don't really care whose name's on the patent. Okay. It doesn't matter. One time they wanted me to go on the Today Show with one of my products and uh, they said, well, look, can you go over there and do this? And I said, I'm busy got something going on. Do you have somebody else that can go? And they go, yeah, well, we can sell, send somebody. I said, well, we'll send them because I, I, I can't miss this meeting. And they go, well, then they'll think that the person sent invented it. And I said, the name is R-I-C-H-A-R-D, middle initial C, last name Levy. Just get it right on the check. And I don't care who they think invented it. <laughs> it doesn't matter to me. Just pay it on time and everything will be fine. So I, I don't have that kind of ego issue with this kind of stuff, you know? Any other questions? Yes? Last time you spoke to us a couple of years ago, was it? Yeah, yeah, I think. Um, you said it was still way cheaper to source in China. After this tax reform, tax reform, do you, how much do you see? Well, I see a lot of companies coming back here now. They're starting. Um, it's a good question. I mean, of course, I don't know, you know, what's going to happen with this tax reform in terms of how many companies coming back. But I can tell you, for years, they, like advertising, they printed it in Michigan. And then all of a sudden, they started taking it to China, even to print games. And now the companies are saying, wait a minute, who needs this aggravation back and forth, containers and customs and all this kind of stuff? We'll just make it in the United States. Now, that's, you're not going to make a Furby in the United States, not anytime soon and get the price. Just not going to do that. But there are a lot of products where companies are saying, and made in the USA is a big deal now on products. I mean, you, they, they, they feature it on the, on the front of the package. So um, I'm sure that you'll have some of that happening. I don't know in the toy industry how much. Look, a lot of it's going to Vietnam. <coughs> it's, it's all about a skilled workforce. I mean, that's why they don't like, there's a lot of South American countries they could take it to where there's just, the workforce isn't skilled like it is in, 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 in Asia and a lot of these. It may be one day, and then they can just run across to Mexico or someplace and get it made. I'm talking toys now, but I'm sure that's true of a lot of products. But yeah, I think a lot of stuff's going to be coming back. Yes? For, for a complicated toy like the Furby, like at what stage do you go to the toy company? Do you have the thing basically working? Excellent question. Excellent question. When, when we went... Nothing was working. It was imagine this and imagine that. And my two partners, one of them's a puppeteer like you, hey, we're going to do this with that. And we sat at the, by the way, this would never happen today. Never happen today. You'd have to go in today with full blown schematics, looks like works like prototypes, everything would have to be moving. And, and the company that did it, Tiger Electronics, was, well, they were ultimately acquired by Hasbro. And um, they were like, I say by cowboys, they were really entrepreneurs. They took risk. They took a lot of risk. And I remember sitting at the table and they looked at me and they said, well, who, who is going to do this complicated mechanism? And I said, well, my partner, he'll, he'll do it. And, but if he can't do it, I've got somebody to do it. Don't, don't worry about it. Okay. Remember, I had a great relationship. And then they said, well, who's going to do these electronics? I said, Dave will do the electronics. Dave is a genius. Dave does, you know, programming and he, he, he's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. Uh, former Navy electronic guy on radar and stuff, you know the thing. And he, okay, let's go. Now, if I went in today to a Hasbro or Mattel with this product, they would say, because we called it Furby, they would say, oh, we'll, we'll make this Mickey Mouse. 
or we'll make this Dora the Explorer, or we'll make this whatever, because today they, brands are much more critical than when I first got in the business. They, they don't want to dig out of a hole by establishing a Furby or whatever it is on a big product like that. So they would just as soon go get the license for Jurassic Park or whatever, any entertainment license you can imagine. And they pay them a lot of money and they figure that they're promoting the movie and everything else. And the only risk there is, is that when the, uh, if the movie gets bad reviews, sometimes the toys are still on the water when the movie dies. You know, there's a risk. But then the board says, well, hey, you tried it with Spielberg. Didn't work, you'll try another one. You know, but today we would never get away. Furby would never, you, you can't go into these big companies today and say, imagine this and imagine that. You just can't do it. It doesn't work that way anymore. It just doesn't work that way. Anybody else? Yes. So could you describe roughly your process? So you mentioned marketing. So there's the addressable market for something you come up with, like maybe, like, maybe there's two people that will ever buy it versus a million. Well, yeah, uh, the, the first thing I do is I try to find something in the pop culture where there's millions of people potential, like the cat paw. Okay. There's a lot of cat lovers and everything else. Of course, I went to a toy company. I could have gone to a pet company. I have contacts in pet companies. But frankly, the pet industry, which is like a 40-some billion dollar industry, and there's a big show, by the way, every year in Orlando, coming up in March. But most of the show is medicine and uh, food. And when you look at the toys, uh, there's not, there's no, there's no, if anybody has it, let me know, we'll make a million bucks. There's absolutely no material that a certain breed of dog can't destroy. <laughs> there is a breed of dog that can destroy just, a, I've been taught this by these guys, just about anything. So um, taking the cat paw to the, to the pet industry is like, um, it's like a chicken, watch, they'd be like a chicken watching card tricks. They just wouldn't get it. But a toy company would get it because they're in the entertainment business. See, and then we, I figured once we establish, we can go backwards to a pet company, but never, never found one. Pet owners love it, but couldn't get Petco, couldn't get, by the way, that's the other thing with mass market products. You're lucky to be in Walmart because if you're not in a Walmart or you're not in a, uh, a Petco, you're not in a, a big box retailer, the chances of you making any money are very slim, very slim, because of what it takes to fill the pipeline, the amount of product it takes to fill the pipeline, because we get paid when that product ships or when that product's first invoiced. It doesn't, if it doesn't sell off the shelf, they're not taking money back from us. That's just it. That's part of their risk. We get paid no matter what. So, you know, you want, you want to try to work with the big companies. So again, you're very fortunate with Walmart. Extremely fortunate. I'm sure it's a great product, but I mean, you're, you're lucky to be in the mass market because if it was some smaller company, you know, you just have something else on your shelf. Right? Did I answer it? Kind of? Okay. Anything else? Richard? Yes. I, I, just a suggestion, but if you were like one of the independent inventors you envisioned in this room that might have something that was applicable to toys or games, and you had it s sort of working, had something, what would you do now? Would you get on the phone and try to... Well, uh, I'll tell you the way it's gone today. In, in, in the old days, I can't believe I'm saying the old days. In the, in the old days, we used to have these constant face-to-face -face meetings, this and that, whatever. Today, if you can make a video, if you can Skype, you know, we do these Skype conferences and stuff, and show it. Don't get too slick with your videos. You're better off with a homebrew. You don't want something so slick that they think you're pulling something off on them. You know what I mean? if it all of a sudden looks like George Lucas produced it. You, you don't need that, you don't need that. Um, but that's, that's the way it starts. And you, I can probably get away with, people like me who've been around a long time can get away with doing less because we have reputations and they believe in us. But you, need, you should really have a looks like, works like prototype that, look, you're not gonna be able to cost it properly because you don't know how, they're, you know how they cost products. Most products, by the way, they do everything is times five on a TV product. 
and you want television if you can get it because that's how you drive numbers. But everything is so, if, if a little screw, if somebody says you, well, this little screw is a dime, no, it's 50 cents. Because by the time they get done calculating it, they're going to calculate it for 50 cents. So there's, they, they have ways of doing things that you can't do. So I don't even try to, frankly, I don't even try to, to cost anything. Now, I'll work with them on value engineering. I'll figure out ways to cost reduce it. But typically, the Chinese can do that. They're genius at it. You know why they're genius at it? Because they want to run the product in their factory. See? So they can reduce their margins. Just to give, if you tell them, well, we're going to run, you know, uh, 50, 60, 80, 000, 100, 000, whatever that number is, if that's a number that impresses them, then they'll, they can make it happen. They can make it happen. And a lot of the toy companies don't even pay for tooling anymore because they say to the factory, we're going to run, you know, 250,000 of these things. Let's, you pay for the tooling, we'll amortize it off. And they don't even put out money for the tools. You know. Uh, the other thing is, if any of you are working with agents in Hong Kong, China, whatever, uh, I'd get on a plane and go over there and meet them face to face. You know, one of the things people tend to do, amateurs tend to do, I mean, I was a TV producer years ago, and I realized I can't be a TV producer and do toys at the same. There's one or the other. I had to commit myself to something, and I committed myself to the toy and game business. And that means getting out, seeing people, having the time to do it, going to trade fairs. You got to get out and do things. You just can't expect your idea to to lift everything alone. You're not just going to send that. The chances of you just sending an idea out and having it happen are slim to none. Are slim to none. And if you want to do things in China and everything else, it's good to get on a plane and get over there, meet your people, let them see you. You'll get a better price. You'll get to know them. There's nothing like, um, you know, we, we, I was working on a project once for Mattel, and uh, we had an engineer in San Jose, and he was never picking up the phone. And we were missing our deadlines, our milestones. And I called the company and I said, let me ask you a question. Who's met this guy? I'm sure he's genius. Well, nobody. So, well, you hired him based on what? Well, re recommendations. Look how brilliant he is. I said, yeah, but he's not picking up the phone. I said, here's what you're going to do. You're going to buy me an airplane ticket. And you're going to fly me to San Jose. It was a product of mine. You're going to fly me to San Jose. I'm going to call this dude up, and I'm going to say, listen, I have to be in San Jose anyway. Fabrication, but, you know, I had to do it. I, I don't want him to think I'm coming in to scold him. I said, i got to be there anyway. I'll be at the Sheridan Hotel. i got a meeting at such and such a time. Can you be here around 7? What's your favorite restaurant? He said, uh, it was an Italian restaurant, whatever. I said, okay, are you married? Yeah, so we'll bring your wife. We'll go to dinner at the Italian restaurant. Look, I gotta leave the next morning. I'm only here real fast, touch and go. He never knew I was there only for him. We had dinner, that was it. He picked up the phone after that. I mean, it just, there was nothing he wouldn't do because it's about relationships. It's about relationships, it's amazing. You sit back here with your ideas and you're, you're shooting this one, shoot. Get out and see people. Get out and meet them, and you'll be amazed at what happens. You'll be amazed. And where would they go? To go out and see people? Well, wherever it is. I mean, what if, if it's China, if you're dealing with, let's say, for example, you have an agent in Los Angeles who says, well, sh sh so and so in China's making this for us. Okay, I'm, I'm going to go over to China. I want to meet them. I meant more about getting the product viewed and. Oh, you mean at the set, companies? At the companies. Well, what's the what's the avenue now? They, well, let me put it to you this way: tool. the place an inventor really has to be inventive is getting through the door of a company, and you got to know how to read through the lines of some of their forms. Like, for example, um, I've worked for Procter and I've sold products to Procter and Gamble, General Foods, and they'll say, "We don't work with." not approved or whatever it is. So you come up, how what do I have to do to be approved? You know, you make relationships. You feel I'm, I'm coming out to Cincinnati. I'll tell you, great Procter and Campbell story. Boy did I get I almost lost it. So I came up with this idea for a bicycle called the Crest Floor Rider. Floor ride? <laughs> it was a big wheel bicycle. And uh, oh, by the way, 
no offense, but this is when I stopped using lawyers for design patents. <laughs> because I paid a couple of thousand dollars for design patent and it was all done by the draftsman. And I said to my lawyer at uh, Cushman, Darby Cushman, is that the name? Big law firm, Cushman, Darby Cushman. I said, what, 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 what did you do? He said, well, we don't, we don't search design patents. I said, so, well, I got you the drawings and everything. So from that point on, I've always done my own design patents, but neither here nor there. So now I get, I barge through to Procter & Gamble, I get through, and um, I send out my, my associate Gary, he draws it up, the crest floor rider, send it out, it gets turned down. Here's where some luck comes in. About a year later, I get a phone call. Hi, this is Barry at uh, Crest. Uh, yeah? Listen, I'm a brand new product manager here. I'm going through the files. I have this cool looking bike. I mean, God, this thing's incredible. Where do I see one? I said, well, we've never built it. So, well, what's it going to cost to build? Well, you have to make bolts of forms and all this stuff. Say it was $15,000, whatever that number is. He said, I'll pay it. I said, okay, make me one. So we hired a guy up in Erie, Pennsylvania. He did it. We sent it out. It was so fragile you couldn't sit on it, but it was a good model to look at. And he says to me, what's this going to cost? And I said, how many are you going to order? And he said, well, we probably order, you know, 250,000, whatever the number was. We were in 33,000 supermarkets around the United States in the end. He said, this is what it's going to be. I said, okay. So I went to our, by the way, these were the years when they were making things in the United States. We had a factory in New Jersey. And Procter & Gamble said, don't go to China. Use a U.S. factory. We're Procter & Gamble. We want to kick the tires. We want to go to the factory and whatever. We're not going to run to China. So I said, okay. So I said to the guy, how much is it going to cost per bike? And he goes, well, at that number, it's, I'm going to say $12.50. You know what a big wheel bike is, right? $12.50. I said, okay. So now I call up the company and they said, so we want 800 of these things. 800. How much is it going to be a piece? I said, uh, $12.50. He goes, that's all? For 800? For a test? I said, yeah, yeah, that's all. So I call back Tim, the guy who owns the factory. I said, Tim, listen, man, I know you're going, in the, you're going down for this because $12.50 is absurd. Could never make it for that. But I said, I guarantee you we're going to get this project. He goes, okay, I'll do it. Now we get the project. And Procter & Gamble says, what's it going to cost per bike? And I said, $12.50. He said, how can it be $12.50 when we order 800, but now we're going to order 250,000 of these things, and it's still $12.50? I said, well, I beat up the factory. And I told him to give me the first number. He said, Richard we would have paid you $1,000 a bicycle for the test, and we would have understood. Now it looks like you're cheating. You know, you're, you know what I said, no, I'm not cheating, this is what it is. It's the first time I've ever done this. He says, okay, fine, we'll let it go. And we let it go. But um, anyway, yes? Yeah, the, um, you know, obviously your relationships <laughs> are licensing, you know, primarily in your industry. Yeah. Just working with the big companies. Have you ever been tempted to do something direct to consumer? <coughs> and then, you know, I know in the toy industry, there's, you know, companies like what's Melissa and Doug and oh, yes. you know, things like that where they, they basically went out there and just, you know, broke into that. Do you have any, any thoughts on that? Yeah, Melissa and Doug is extremely, an extremely uh, successful company. I always felt that I wanted to have a life. Okay? that my wife and I, if we wanted to go somewhere the next day, if I wanted to go away, it's nice to license. Because I could be anywhere. I could be here doing this. I don't have to tomorrow morning. It doesn't matter. I'm not worrying about, somebody said to me once, do you realize how much money you can make if you did your own product? No, I'm talking about not a fur. I'm talking about a simple product. I said, yeah. And I'm also going to get a phone call that there's a safety problem. And I'm also going to get a call that there's a longshoreman strike. And, and the containers are stuck off Long Beach, California, and, and I'm pulling my hair, not that I have much left, but I'm pulling out whatever hair I have left. And I worked once with uh, Bonwood Teller on a project, my wife and I, and we sold them uh, some kind of clothing. And they said, because it was late in coming in, and they said, listen, 
if you don't have, they're called ruanas, it's a Colombian woolen uh, seropic, he said, if you don't have that product at our warehouse on the Lower East Side, by tomorrow when we walk into the office, the order's canceled. And I called up my cousin, Cliff, and I said, your wife know how to sew? She goes, yeah. I said, get over here with a sewing machine. I've got the wheels of, you know, the bond would tell her, whatever they are, the labels. I said, come over here. We're working all night long. We hopped in my old Mercury Marquee. My wife, myself, my cousin, we drove to the lower docks of Manhattan, and we dropped those puppies off early. We're up all night long. I don't want stuff. I, I know I can make a lot more money, but I just, it doesn't interest me to do that. And in my book, the book that you have here, um, I say that in there. I said, you know, if you want to do something yourself, then stop reading here and go to this part of the book. I mean, I'm all about licensing, frankly. I'm all about licensing. And, and I know you lose control and everything else, but let me tell you something. If you have the kind of relationship that I built with companies, not just me, but a lot of, you know, if you build the right kind of relationship, you won't lose control. They'll respect you. They'll want to know what you think. And even though they have the final say, I can put up arguments, you know, but at the end of the day, they're risking their money. And I make a very nice living. Yeah. So that's it. But there's nothing wrong with making your own product. I just don't want to have 12,000 or something sitting in my basement. <laughs> right? No. And that can happen. And the other risk in making your own product, you go to Walmart, now you're a different case, and you're, but you say you're the manufacturer. You could, somebody's manufacturing it for you. You're the manufacturer, and you get into Bed Bath & Beyond, one of these big Home Depots or something, and they sell it for a year or so, and they go, what's next? Huh? Well, what's next? Remember, they've gone through a lot to give you a vendor number. A lot of companies are bought just for their vendor numbers. Like, they'll buy a company because they have vendor numbers at all these big outfits. So um, I don't want to have to be in a, in a squirrel cage existence I don't want to be a toy company coming up with something constantly. I just don't want to do that. So it's a choice. Yes? Uh, I 100% understand relationship. That is, now suppose somebody has a product and you sign a licensing contract 5% per unit. And after a few months, after a year, the product turned out to be very successful. Yeah in the contract or you can try to get out and sell it? No, here's what I do. What I do is I say to companies, if it's very successful, I want an escalating royalty if I can get it. Hasbro, Mattel are not going to do this. But the smaller, you know, there are good companies that will do it. And if it succeeds, my royalty goes up. Now, I remember I used to be on the board of IPO, Intellectual Property Owners. I was, for two, I was the independent inventor on their board. No one ever listened to me. I was there. And they used to hear my deals, these guys from IBM and Pepsi, they thought they were crazy. They said, the more successful, the royalty should go down. I said, well, that doesn't happen in my world. It goes up. One time I said to somebody, I said, uh, so I'd like, to, what do I have to do to get 12% or 7%? Well, I some absurd, you know, whatever. It'll never do that. Yeah, I know. But what do I have to do to get that? He said, we'll never do it. I said, well, if we'll never do it, why don't you just put it in the contract? Often they do. And guess what happens? Sometimes I get lucky. <laughs> See? Because I know one thing the companies don't know. I have more faith in my products than they do. See? And I also know one thing. I know that nothing they do, well, I shouldn't say nothing they do, but they, they're not controlling the success or failure of a product. You know, I said to somebody about Furby once, I said, the head of marketing, who's a brilliant guy, I said, God, he has such a brilliant job. He goes, no, 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 it just exploded. It happened. The planet's lined up. I appreciate the compliments, but the planet's lined up. In other words, sometimes I know that they don't have control over what, I did. here, how did I know that my cat paw was going to get on David Letterman? How did I know that Anna Kendrick the actress was going to hold it in her hand and call it a dildo. 
my wife and I were sitting in bed one night. We were sitting there watching the uh, impressions on, you know, we're watching Google, Catpaw, and all of a sudden, People Magazine, us, all tied to Anna Kendrick making this comment. You can find it if you Google it. And all of a sudden, everything just sailed. So who, you can't, do you know what I mean? But you gotta be positioned for that. You gotta keep trying, I mean, that's what I'm saying. You gotta keep pushing to put yourself into a position where that could happen. Right. Can you license to more than one companies? Good question. Yes, I have. I've licensed more than one. I have a. We had a, a direct response television product a few years ago, a cake decorator. So I took it to Kuhn Recon. It's a Swiss company that makes uh, serious. You ever hear of them? Kuhn Recon. They make serious cooking products, bakery products. And I said, listen. I said, I want to license this for toys. Mom, we want the rights. I said, no, 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 you don't want the rights. You're never going to do a toy. I said, and our products will never cross because you're going to be in Bed Bath & Beyond and Sur La Table and all these other places, and we're going to be in the Isles of Toys R Us. See, we're in the Isles of Toys R Us. And, uh, okay, and I said, and frankly, the more moms that buy this for their kids or vice versa, they'll cross-collateralize. They could help each other. <coughs> and then I went to Hasbro, and I said, listen, they said, well, we don't want anybody else to have the rights. I said, you're not going into Sur La Table. And you're not going to do a high-end product. You're going to make a toy. And it was the first time I was able to actually, I cut the contract three ways. I also cut out DRTV, direct response television. That never happened. I could have done it. I had a company that wanted to do it, but I didn't want to impact the sales of the other two companies. So even though I had the right to do it, remember pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered? I just said, forget, we won't market that. We'll just let it sit. And I turned that deal down. But yes, I've sold to more than one company. And tip, companies are tip, look, the, the one mistake you can't make is giving a company global rights, this right, if they're not going to commercialize them. And if they insist with me on those kinds of rights, I say, okay, we're going to put a clock on international. Put a clock on it. If within one year, I say, you pick the, what do you need, a year? You need a year and a half? You need two? What, I let them pick the number. Whatever you, t you tell me that you need two years to do international, fine. If it doesn't happen, every country you haven't done comes back to me. Yeah. And also, when I try to get a higher royalty, and they'll say, well, what, what, I say, you tell me what the break point is. It's a gamble anyway, what's the difference? They said, well, how about 250,000? Fine! You put it up to 250,000. The chances of getting 250,000, very slim. But guess what? Sometimes the toy gods smile. And it happens. And then I'm positioned. But I like to let them set some of these numbers so I don't come off as being a pig. Because I know it's just extra money anyway. Right? Anything else? Yes. How do you determine market viability? Is it pure instinct, or do you actually do a thorough research? No, it's instinct. I can, now, today I go to Google. In the old days, I'd read whatever, the newspapers and stuff. Because I have to build a case. When I go into a company, I build a case. I say to them, listen, these are the demographics, this is where I think this can go, blah, blah, blah. And, they, and then they check it. They do their own research. But with me, it's strictly, it's mostly gut. It's mostly, remember one thing, it takes a year and a half to two years sometimes, depending, to get a product on the market. So we're, we're thinking that far, behind, you know, I mean, we're thinking now for 20. I don't know what's gonna be going on in the world in 20. Who knows? But they need product, and it takes that long to get a product out. So we basically work a lot on gut. I mean, I don't do focus groups unless it's colors, you know, what color do you like? But if I, if I, I heard a story once, they did a focus group on something called My Little Pony. Remember, my, you all know My Little Pony? But they put it up against Cabbage Patch. Well, at the time, Cabbage Patch was the hottest thing in the country. So every little girl in the focus group said, I want Cabbage Patch. Nobody wanted My Little Pony. But the executive in charge of My Little Pony said, this is crazy, little girls love ponies. We're gonna do it anyway. And My Little Pony today is a monster of a brand. So you can't always live by those. You know what I mean? It is, it, it's called the paralysis of analysis. 
I also have a sign in my office that says, thou shalt not committee. <laughs> because that's the quickest way to kill things. Anything else? Yeah, go ahead. Yes. Do you do anything in the way of market research? No, I just, whatever I read in newspapers, magazines and stuff, I mean, I'm basically, again, paralysis of analysis. I, I, look, I could, if market analysis meant so much, you wouldn't have failures. Market analysis, up until 9 o'clock on election night, Hillary Clinton was the winner. All the exit polls, all of this, all the pundits, everything else, and then this guy wakes up the next morning, President of the United States. So this kind of stuff, you know, I mean, you can only put so much into the research. I'm not against research at all, don't get me wrong. But you got to know when to, you know, sometimes it's the, it's the gut reaction, the, the gut feeling of uh, whoever it is. Something that comes to mind with this is uh, the marshmallow, I want to say marshmallow test. Marshmallow test? Challenge. Challenge. Challenge? The people that succeed are the ones that actually take the marshmallow and put it on the spaghetti a bunch of times. Yeah. Namely kindergartners. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. While the adults are like, all right, we got 30 seconds left, they put it on top and the whole thing falls. Yeah, yeah, no, I got you. That's why I used to love with my daughter. I would say to my daughter, all the time, Betty, what do you think about this? She said, kid, she goes, I go, oh, brilliant. Absolutely brilliant, because they do things differently. They do things differently. You know, they, and they don't, listen, I, I met Rubik once, Erno Rubik, the first year of the Rubik Cube, the mathematician of Hungary. And I said, Erno, I gotta ask you a question. Maybe I called him Dr. Rubik, I don't know. I said, Ideal Toy had the product. I said, why is it that the youngest child can do this toy, can solve it in what, a minute, second, you know, you read these stories, and adults can't? He gave me a great answer. He said, because nobody told the child it can't be done. And we adults tend to, my daughter used to take her to a swimming pool, and I'd say, Betty, why? Let's go to the high dive. Okay, Daddy. She jumps off the high dive. Now she's 15 years old. Let's go to the high dive. What are you, nuts? <laughs> you know, because you, as you grow and everything, you tend to, you know. Yes? So, I talk to a lot of people, and often I will say stuff that when I tell other people what I told them, they'll be like, oh, yeah, that was good advice. But when I'm talking to somebody that they often shut down, Either because it's not their idea or because they're very set. Oh, you mean the not invented here syndrome? Yeah. You're talking about? Oh, it's, it's prevalent everywhere. So do you have any tricks to dealing with that? Or? No, it's, it's, it's just everywhere. <laughs> you got to get to the right people. I mean, no, and I'm very careful also, by the way, I, I'm going to Toy Fair and uh, there's an element of one of our games. And I said, you know, Tim, I said, I'm not going to tell him about this game involves an envelope, whatever. I said, I'm going to see if they like my idea for the game. The idea is this. I'm not going to get into gameplay. Because if they don't like the idea, like Men Are From Mars. It, it, with Men Are From Mars, they said, what's the game? And I said, I don't know. And they said, well, what are we buying? I said, you're buying Men Are From Mars from Men Are From Venus. You ask Steven Spielberg what the game is when it's Jurassic Park? I said, I'll tell you what. I said, you know I can create games. You license this. I'll then create the game. And guess what? If you don't like it or I get hit by a car, you got a bunch of geniuses around the table here who will do the game. Okay. So with this envelope business, pitching it, I'm going to pitch this product next week. So Tim said, well, tell them about the envelope. I said, no, I'll tell you why. Because if they like my concept, then I'll go back and make a formal presentation and write up the rules. But if I just say, hey, and it involves this envelope, and they don't take the concept, that might migrate into another product one year. So oh, well, let's add an envelope. And they'll forget where they ever heard it. So you have to stage it. You, it's t you figure it out with experience. But in my business, it's all about headlines. Do you know what I mean? And if they don't like Men Are From Mars, or they don't like whatever that headline is, and if they like it, then, I'll, then I'll, I'll work on it. But if they don't, what am I killing myself for? Doing all this work, and they're gonna say no. Because I'd say 80% of what I do now is tied to a brand. The other good trick is, in the toy industry, 
try to extend an existing brand from a company. Like you see all the Twister products, all the Boppet products, all the Connect Four products. In other words, they have a brand. It sells millions of units every year. If you can give them another way to do Connect Four and still call it Connect Four, right? You may take a little less royalty, but you don't have to sell. I mean, the brand's there. Play-Doh, here's an example. Play-Doh. If you can show them a way to use Play-Doh in, in a new and innovative way, they've already got the brand. So they'll, so they'll cut a few points or a point or something off your royalty. So what? You've got a freight train going. You know, they're there and they control shelf space everywhere. In fact, most of these big brands control shelf space and the companies just fill the shelves. And if it doesn't work, they'll clean it up and put something else in there. But you'll get paid. You'll get paid. And the last thing I'll say is, um, my system for my modus operandi works in every industry pretty much. I don't care if I'm selling something to Boeing aircraft or a medical device or whatever it is. Um, medical device, I would not be doing my own patents. But something like that, you know, um, it's the same system. It works on the same system because they're all human beings and everybody motivated. You know what I mean? You just, you just size it up. Bottom line is they're people. We're entrepreneurs. They're people with jobs. Their jobs are dependent on when they buy your product, you, you could be, they could be a hero the next day or they could be out of work for betting on the wrong horse. You just don't know. So, but what I advise, my advice works across I believe every industry with modifications, right? Yes. Um, are you accessible if you think if some if we have an idea like I think I have a very good idea for a game? Are you accessible that we're I could be able to present it to you? Mm, not really. Uh, I, I do. I, we do so much in house. You know what I mean? We do so much stuff in house that it's difficult for me to. You know, to st I don't. Let me tell you something about people who look at your ideas. Also, just I think this is important. Um, I have looked at outside ideas over my career. I'm not stupid. If I see something I like, you know, and somebody's creative enough to get to me, but I've never charged a dime. Never charged a dime to look at something. And I have a saying. Ad equals bad. In other words, anybody that reaches you through advertising and all this kind of stuff. Because listen, you get a sense now that I know a lot of people in the toy industry, right? I don't know anybody in medical, I don't know anybody, well, but I know them in the toy industry. I know their wives, I know their kids, I know when their birthdays are, we go on vacations together. That's the kind of relationship <coughs> that you need in an industry to really have access. So these people that advertise, you know, invention marketing, all this kind of stuff, there's no way they know people in all these industries. Now somebody like Little, is that his name? He's hired by certain companies to scout for them. Is that his name, Warren Little? Uh, like Warren Tuttle. Warren Tuttle. Yes, he is. Yeah. See, he's, he's different. I mean, he's, he probably doesn't charge anything because he's paid by the company. And he's working for Walmart or for this one or that one. That's a whole other story. I'm talking, and he's not shotgunned all over the place. He's got clients that pay him to scout. Because I've talked to people that pay him. Because they don't have the time, they don't want the staff, they don't, so he does it for them. That's okay. But the people that say, you give me a hundred bucks, I'll read your thing, or give me whatever, that's a lot of crap. I mean, I, I wouldn't go anywhere near it. There's no way they're gonna be successful. Okay, so you're not accessible, but what about some of the, does Mattel, Hasbro, or any of the others have innovation centers where a okay, nobody so can come you, in? Yeah, you can, look, you can contact Hasbro and say to Hasbro, look, in my book, I've got a list of agents for the toy industry, but I got the list from Hasbro. They will, if you call up Hasbro, they will say to you, you, you can say, listen, I'd like to present, but I'd like the name of an agent. They'll give you agents. Go to them because it'll be up to date. And they'll say, here are three. But none of them should charge you. They may take 50% of, because it's common in the toy industry, 50% with a broker. But they shouldn't charge you a dime. Not for initially, but you're saying 50% if you get a contract. Yes, and they shouldn't charge you anything initially. In other words, not a dime. Yeah. Not a dime. 
I'm not also getting 50 percent. And and the you and, and the best brokers are the ones that can work with you on developing it, not just knocking on a door and selling it, but they can enhance it. You know what I mean? I'll tell you for one last story. Because it's all stories in my life. Um, so there's a, have everybody heard of Scrabble Slam? S L A M. It's a card game. Somebody shaking their head. So. The inventor's a good friend of mine. So for three years, he's trying to sell this thing to Hasbro. Scrabble's an interesting thing. Mattel has the rights outside the United States. Hasbro has the rights inside the United States. Kind of crazy. But um, so they turned it down like three times. So this friend of mine who's an agent, he's walking in Joe's studio, and he says, what's this? He says, oh, that's um, the game I did. Hasbro's turned it down three times. He goes, they have? So... I looked at it. He looked at it. He goes, well, this is the greatest thing in the world. You can't believe they turned it down. So they turned it down. He says, give it to me. We'll go 50 /50. Okay, fine. He got it. They sold 4 million copies. Because even though Hasbro turned it down three times, it was in the past, and things are constantly changing. There's new executives. There's Not new, now. Huh? Not now. Not now. Yeah, exactly. Not now. So they sold 4 million copies of it. So, and it took Howard to do it. So, anyway, listen, you've been a wonderful audience. I appreciate it. Hope you had fun.